Hello, my name is Alex Sverdlov. I am a biostatistician working at Novartis. And today I'm going to talk about early phase trial designs in rare diseases. Here's a standard disclaimer I have to give. The main purpose of this presentation is educational. It provides information on my personal thinking on early phase trial designs in rare diseases. It doesn't provide any data from Novartis projects and the ideas presented herein are my own and shouldn't be construed to represent the views or policies of Novartis. Here is the outline of the presentation. We will start with some background on the development of novel therapies for rare diseases. We will review some important challenges and opportunities for applying statistical innovation in this context. After that, we will consider some adaptive phase one trial designs for those finding. These designs facilitate learning about the underlying dose toxicity relationship while protecting study participants from overly toxic doses. And we will cover some data analysis issues following these designs and we'll discuss the approaches for making decisions on the maximum tolerated dose. After that, we will discuss some more advanced methods for dose finding, namely phase one, two trial designs that incorporate both toxicity and early efficacy in dose finding objectives. And we'll also discuss the added values of such designs. And finally, we will highlight some additional important topics on early development clinical trials that will be hopefully covered elsewhere in this lecture series. So let us start with the background and development of novel therapies for rare diseases. First of all, what is a rare disease? It is important to acknowledge that there is no unique and universally accepted definition of a rare disease. In the United States, a rare disease is defined as a disease or condition affecting less than 200,000 people. That's based on the Orphan Drug Act of 1983. In Europe, a rare disease is defined as one that affects fewer than five in 10,000 people, or one in 2,000 people in the European economic area. There is also a category of ultra rare diseases, and these are often defined as affecting one patient per 50,000 people. While individually rare, these diseases are collectively common. In fact, currently there are more than 7,000 rare diseases. In the US, an estimated number of Americans living with a rare disease is about 25 to 30 million, whereas worldwide, this number is around 300 million. Clearly, the disease prevalence is important, and as the disease prevalence decreases, the feasibility of designing clinical trials that could establish efficacy and safety of new treatments becomes more difficult. And so does the economic sustainability of delivering approved treatments for rare diseases. The good news is that different countries have established incentives for the development of treatments for rare diseases, and these include prolonged patent protection, market exclusivity, tax credits, and exemption of user fees. Having said all that, rare disease drug development has many challenges and at the same time opportunities for innovation. The major challenge comes from the nature of rare diseases. We're dealing with small and heterogeneous patient populations. Therefore, there is a great concern on how to design and conduct clinical trials for obtaining substantial evidence on safety and effectiveness for approval. What's important is that clinical trials for rare diseases must meet the same standards as for more prevalent diseases. As per 2006 
EMA guideline on clinical trials in small populations, we have the following statements. There are no special methods for designing, analyzing, carrying out clinical trials in small populations. There are, however, approaches to increase the efficiency of clinical trials. The need for statistical efficiency should be weighed against the need for clinically relevant interpretable results, the latter being the most important. And guidelines, ICH, CHMP, and others related to common diseases are also applicable to rare diseases. In situations where obtaining controlled evidence on the efficacy and safety of a new treatment is not possible, the regulatory assessment may accept different approaches if they ensure the patient's interests are protected. That said, it's important to apply innovative methods and have proactive discussions with health authorities on drug development plans. Some additional challenges for rare disease drug development are highlighted here. Many rare diseases have poorly understood natural history. They lack fit for purpose biomarkers or endpoints that measure benefits or risks. And in addition, many rare diseases have genetic bases and many of these diseases start in childhood and last into adulthood. So the optimal time of intervention may be a challenge. This slide shows some relevant regulatory guidelines on rare disease drug development. The already mentioned 2006 EMA guideline on clinical trials in small populations is very useful in this context. From FDA, there are several recent guidances that are honorable mentions. For example, the 2011 draft document on early drug development and the role of pre-IND meetings. The 2019 draft guidance on natural history studies that can be used to support the development of drugs and biological products for rare diseases. And most recent, the December 2023 guidance on considerations for the development of drugs and biological products in rare diseases is very useful. It covers various topics, including non-clinical studies, clinical pharmacology, safety, efficacy, effectiveness considerations. And it also covers aspects related to patient advocacy groups, pediatric clinical trials, interactions with health authorities, etc. Please refer to the links below to get more information on existing relevant guidelines on regulatory uh, approaches to rare disease drug development. Before the Delving into details on early development clinical trials, it is useful to get a broad picture on the drug development process. Traditionally, this process consists of several phases, including the non-clinical and clinical phases. The non-clinical studies for a small molecule or a biological compound include animal studies, in vitro and in silica experiments to characterize the pharmacology and toxicology profile of the compound and to identify a range of doses that are suitable for testing in humans. The clinical development paradigm starts with an investigational new drug or IND application to start human testing in a phase one first in human study. Typically, phase one studies are conducted in healthy volunteers if the conditions are non-severe, or they may be in patients, for instance, in oncology indications. The goals of phase one is to characterize the drug pharmacokinetics, pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic or PKPD relationship, establish safety and tolerability, and determine a dose or a range of doses with meaningful pharmacological activity. The sample size of a first in human study is in the range of 20 to 100 subjects. Following phase one, we have phase 2A studies, 
sometimes referred to as proof of concept studies. And these are conducted in patients with the disease to evaluate the biological activity of the compound and establish a range of doses for subsequent assessment in phase 2b, those range finding studies that aim at evaluating those response for safety and efficacy and identifying a dose or doses for confirmatory clinical trials. The sample size of a phase two clinical trial program is in the range of 100 to 300 patients. The phase three studies are randomized placebo controlled experiments in patients with the disease that are designed to formally test some clinical research hypotheses. And the sample size of a phase three experiment could be several hundred to several thousands of patients. The goal is to obtain confirmatory evidence of efficacy and safety, and also obtain the information on the recommended dose and subgroups to include in the drug label. Usually, phase three studies follow a two trials paradigm to provide evidence of replicability and ensure that the findings are robust in different experimental settings. And following successful phase three trials, there is a submission to health authorities for marketing authorization. And once the drug is approved and marketed, there are also phase four studies that are real world studies in patients to assess long-term efficacy and safety of the drug. Now, the drug development process for rare diseases may be quite different from the traditional case. And this is because of the small target populations, the high unmet medical need and the requirement to demonstrate disease modifying effects. Clinical trials for rare diseases may follow a more integrated and more seamless pathway combining different phases of development, such as phase one, two, phase two, three, and so on. The use of natural history data becomes of paramount importance. And for some indications, there is very limited natural history data, or this data may be completely absent. As shown in the schematic, natural history data informs the design of both phase one, two and phase two, three clinical trials. The phase one, two studies may explicitly include the assessment of early efficacy because now the compound will be tested in patients with the disease. And usually the dose range exploration is not as rich as in the traditional pharmaceutical products such as low molecular weight or biological products. Keep in mind that the treatment interventions for rare diseases may be very advanced modalities such as cell and gene therapies that could be one-time administrations. And there may be no redosing of the patients because once the drug is administered, any additional doses could induce a severe immune response. The dose finding and pivotal studies may be combined in a single phase two, three study to generate evidence of efficacy and safety. The natural history and patient registry data can help develop appropriate endpoints to support phase two, three studies. And in the extreme case of ultra rare diseases, one can think of combining phase one, two, and three into a single protocol. Uh, the phase four or real world evidence studies to evaluate long-term efficacy and safety play a very special role in the rare disease cases. In fact, if we take gene therapies, uh, the current regulatory requirements include up to 50 years of long-term follow-up for each participant. And having said all that, the drug development process for rare diseases require special considerations and innovative approaches to evidence generation that may include 
the use of Bayesian methods, adaptive designs, surrogate endpoints, biomarkers, modeling and simulation, model informed drug development, the use of master protocols, real world data, real world evidence studies. And remember that the standards of quality should be the same as for more prevalent diseases and all principles of good research, such as randomization, blinding, the use of control group, also apply in the rare disease settings. Now, what can statisticians do to add value to clinical development programs in rare diseases? Traditionally, statistical support included the design analysis and reporting of clinical trials. This is even documented as a requirement in the ICH E9 guidance. That is, all statistical work should be performed by a qualified and experienced statistician. However, with increasing complexity of drug development programs, there is a call for more advanced skill set for a statistical scientists. That includes integration of areas such as statistics, data science, machine learning, pharmacometrics, and some more specialized expertise such as bioinformatics, computational biology, just to name a few. Clearly, it may be very challenging to find experts who possess all these skills in one individual, and therefore, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies have different groups specializing in particular quantitative disciplines. And there is a strong need for collaboration among these groups to address challenging drug development program. In many companies, statistics and pharmacometrics are actually integrated in one function, the quantitative scientists, sciences that support drug development programs. Let us now take a high level view on phase one and phase one two studies. The primary goals of these studies include the evaluation of safety, tolerability, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the compound. And also, depending on the disease, the evaluation of early efficacy, such as response to treatment, may be of big importance. Since there is a large uncertainty on the properties of investigational compounds in early clinical trials, the phase one dose finding studies are typically cast as staggered cohort dose escalation designs, which means that only if a current dose is established to be sufficiently safe can the next cohort of patients be dosed at the higher dose level? The endpoints of phase one and phase one, two trials include safety and tolerability, such as incidents of adverse events of special in interest, may include molecular biomarkers, soluble biomarkers, and some markers of response. The sample size depends on the disease setting and usually three patients per dose level is quite common. The desired outcomes from these studies include the characterization of short-term safety, tolerability and early efficacy and developing dose exposure response models is important keeping in mind all the limitations of such studies, which are small sample sizes and limited patient populations, and sometimes lack of control group, lack of blinding, etc. And ideally, we would like to have a recommended phase two, three dose uh, that would be estimated based on the data from phase one and phase one, two studies. Now, uh, one additional important consideration that I would like to highlight is the so-called treatment versus experimentation dilemma. First, there is a fundamental question to treat or to learn. The individual ethics or treatment goal requires that every 
patient in the study is treated at the dose that is closest to the optimal. But unfortunately, that dose is unknown up, up front. And in fact, the very goal of the dose finding trials is to reliably identify this dose. At the same time, the collective ethics or experimental goal concerns the efficient estimation of the optimal dose to benefit future patients. And so these two seemingly similar objectives may actually be in conflict. The use of adaptive designs that incorporate the treatment and learning goals in one experiment uh, is intended to provide a meaningful compromise between these objectives. The second important consideration that we should be mindful of is the broader picture of drug development. Uh, there are multiple experimental treatments from different sponsors that may be studied for the same disease or same indications. And so the question is, can we engage in a collaborative pre-competitive effort to identify optimal treatments? So some novel approaches to drug developments include the use of master protocols such as basket umbrella and platform trial designs that may be very useful in the context of rare diseases. Let us now discuss phase one dose toxicity studies. Here, we assume the oncology setting, although the ideas apply more broadly. Phase one studies are typically small, uncontrolled, sequential study of patients with the disease. And the goal is to determine the maximum tolerated dose or MTD of the experimental drug. This dose is thought to provide clinical efficacy with acceptable level of side effects. And the accurate determination of MTD is, of course, crucial because this dose will be taken forward for testing in subsequent phase two clinical trials. Since toxicity or side effects are severe in oncology, the design considerations are very important, and they usually concern the right balance between the individual and collective ethics. In other words, maximum information from the experiment should be gained with the minimum number of study participants. The statistical methods for phase one trials uh, have important assumptions, and one of them is the monotone relationship between the dose level and the risk of toxicity. There are two different philosophies in the MTD definition. One is that the risk of toxicity is a sample statistic. And the second one is that the risk of toxicity is a probability and the maximum tolerated dose is a quantile of a monotonic dose toxicity curve that is to be estimated based on experimental data. The second approach can use both non-parametric or parametric statistical methods. There are several classes of phase one designs to determine MTD. The first one is the algorithm-based and non-parametric designs. So these designs require no parametric assumption on the dose toxicity relationship. And if we have an algorithm-based design, then the dose escalation rules can be tabulated before the trial starts. Some examples include the famous three plus three design and generalizations such as A plus B designs, accelerated titration designs and up and down designs. The second class is the model assisted designs. And so the designs in this class assume a simple statistical model such as beta binomial model for efficient decision-making. And similar to algorithm-based designs, the model-assisted designs have all decision rules retabulated before the trial starts. Some examples of model-assisted designs are the modified toxicity probability interval or MTPI design, the Bayesian optimal interval design or Boyan, and many others. Finally, the model-based designs are based on parametric statistical models of the dose toxicity curve. 
and that those assignments are made sequentially or group sequentially based on the updated information on the dose toxicity curve. Some examples include the continual reassessment method, Bayesian logistic regression methods, and some others. Please refer to the following review papers for more details on phase one adaptive designs. This slide shows some important considerations or building blocks for developing a phase one trial design. We need to have a set of doses to be studied, D1 up to DK. There has to be a maximum sample size predetermined based on budgetary and statistical considerations. There must be a starting dose level, usually the lowest dose. The cohort size or the number of patients to be assigned per dose, the statistical model for dose toxicity curve, and the method for sequential assignment of doses to cohorts or so-called adaptive dose escalation rule. The stopping rule and the criterion for choosing an MTD at the end of the study. And this may include several approaches, for instance, selecting an MTD empirically based on a set of studied doses or estimating the MTD by extrapolating beyond the doses studied. Some examples of phase one design. So the simplest one is the three plus three design. And its rule is so, such that the patients are treated in cohorts of size three, starting with the lowest dose, and the doses are never skipped when escalated. And there is a maximum of six patients that can be treated at any dose. Suppose three patients are treated at a given dose and no toxicities are observed. Then a decision is made just to escalate the next cohort at the next dose. If one out of three toxicities are observed, then the decision is made to treat the next cohort of patients at the same dose. And if two or more toxicities are observed, the MTD has been exceeded. Suppose six patients are treated at the given dose, and in case of one observed toxicity, the decision is made to escalate to the next dose. In case of exactly two toxicities, then the dose is declared to be the maximum tolerated dose, and three or more toxicities imply that the MTD has been exceeded. The three plus three design is very simple and very popular in practice. However, it has very poor statistical properties. It identifies MTD imprecisely and unreliably, and many patients are treated at suboptimal dose levels. Here's another example, which is random walk rule. Unlike the three plus three method, the random walk rule targets a specific quantile of the dose toxicity curve. For a specified target toxicity level, for example, 20%, we define B, which is gamma over one minus gamma, the bias coin probability. And then the dose assignments are made sequentially such that, for instance, if at a given dose there is a observed toxicity, then the next patient is treated at the lower dose level or a decision is to de-escalate the next dose. However, if no toxicity is observed, then the next patient is randomized to either stay at the current dose or to be treated at the next highest dose. And suitable modifications are made at the lowest and highest doses. An advantage of the random walk rule is that, first of all, it requires no assumption on the dose toxicity curve other than monotonicity, and it has well-established statistical properties. It clusters those assignments around the target MTD. In fact, the empirical mode of the dose assignments is an unbiased estimate of the MTD. A disadvantage of the random walk rule is that it cannot be pre-tabulated before the trial starts because of the randomization rules that are involved. 
Here's another example of a phase one design, the modified toxicity probability interval or MTPI developed by G and co-authors. For a specified target toxicity level, such as 20%, we define three non-overlapping dose intervals for dose escalation decisions that correspond to the underdosing, proper dosing, or overdosing. A beta binomial model is assumed for the dose, for the toxicity probability at a given dose. And the interval with highest posterior probability triggers the decision for the next cohort of patients. This design is very simple to implement. It's rule can be tabulated before the start of the trial. And actually, because of the use of beta binomial model, this design outperforms the 3 plus 3 design in terms of the MTD identification. One disadvantage, however, is that the MTP MTPI decision rule lacks clear clinical interpretation and it may lead to an increased risk of overdosing. There are many more phase one designs available. Books have been written on specific methods and some papers reporting simulation studies comparing various designs are available. The best advice is to please work with the statistician to select the design that is most fit for purpose for your trial. There is no shortage of software packages for design and analysis of phase trials. And one example is given here from MD Anderson Cancer Center, and there are many more. A very important question is how to analyze data following a phase one trial. The probability of toxicity can be modeled as a two parameter logistic curve, which is displayed here. The parameters are alpha and beta, and they are to be estimated from experimental data. The estimated alpha and beta can also be used to obtain estimates of the MTD, which in this case is defined as the 20th percentile of the dose toxicity curve, and it's displayed as a dose here. Having the data, those levels, number of patients assigned at these dose levels, and the number of toxicities, we can model the dose toxicity curve. So the number of toxicities at dose DI is modeled as a binomial random variable with the probability depending on the dose toxicity curve. The maximum likelihood estimates of the parameters with associated uncertainties can be obtained. Now, it's important to always check the modeling assumptions, and here, please work with the statistician. Here is an example of a phase one dose toxicity study. It was a trial with 34 leukemia patients treated at five different doses. The number of patients assigned per dose, the number of toxicities, and the proportions of toxicities are summarized in this table. Based on these data, a two-parameter logistic model was fitted to obtain the parameter estimates of alpha and beta, as shown here. The estimates of toxicity probabilities with 95% confidence intervals were obtained. These are displayed in blue. An estimate of the MTD, which is in our case the 20th percentile of the dose toxicity curve, is displayed in dark green, and the 95% confidence interval is shown here in the figure. Note that the estimated MTD is different from the actual doses studied. In other words, we used statistical model to extrapolate beyond the set of doses studied. And because of the small data set, of course, the estimation uncertainty of the MTD is high. Another important question that one may ask is whether we can optimize the design of the next phase one study for a similar compound 
And the answer is yes. If we consider the so-called the optimal design, it is a design that maximizes the information on the dose toxicity curve. And for the two-parameter logistic model, it's a two-point design that assigns half of the sample size at the 18th percentile of the curve and the other half of the sample size to the 82nd percentile of the curve. This design depends on the knowledge of the true model parameters that are unknown up front, but their estimates may be available. And one limitation of this design is that it may not be clinically optimal because as you see from this figure, half of the sample size is assigned at the dose that corresponds to the 82nd percentile, so this dose may be viewed as too toxic. However, this design can be used as a benchmark to facilitate a comparison among different designs. And here is an example of how such a comparison can be performed. So, let us consider the data from our described study. It's displayed in, in the figure on the left. So the, the number of um, those assignments are shown here. And the D-optimal design that is displayed in the figure on the right would assign 17 patients at the two different doses displayed in the right figure. The Efficiency of the implemented design relative to the D-optimal design for the same sample size of 34 is 82%. So what it means in practice that the sample size of the implemented design would have to be increased by 18%, which is six extra patients to match the estimation efficiency of the D-optimal design. And if we are dealing with the rare disease setting, of course, every subject counts and a sample size of six may be viewed as a reasonably large number. In summary, I would like to highlight some strategic questions to consider when designing phase one trials. First of all, how to quantify the study objectives? Second, how could one construct a design that facilitates learning about the dose toxicity relationship while protecting participants from exposure to two toxic doses? And finally, how would one analyze data following the implemented design and make decisions about the maximum tolerated dose? So the best piece of advice is that it should be a collaborative work and please work with the statistician. Let us now discuss phase one, two designs for efficacy toxicity studies. If we consider a conventional approach for developing a cytotoxic compound in oncology, it includes a phase one study to identify the maximum tolerated dose and a subsequent phase two study to evaluate the activity or response at, at this dose. However, such an approach may be problematic in targeted therapy development where experimental doses have lower potential for toxicity and dose response curve may peak or reach plateau at doses below the MTD. An alternative approach is to consider a phase one, two design that combines toxicity and efficacy considerations in dose finding objectives. Some advantages of such an integrated approach are as follows. First of all, the doses with desirable risk benefit can be identified more efficiently than in a sequence of standalone phase one and two trials. Second, the joint modeling of dose efficacy toxicity relationship may be useful. And third, the phase one, two trial avoids an administrative weight between phase one and two protocol activation. At the same time, phase one, two trial designs may be more complex than standalone phase one and two designs, and they may require more upfront planning. The upshot is that biologically optimal doses can be identified more reliably with greater statistical precision. 
Here is an example of a phase one, two trial with bivariate binary outcomes. We have doses D1 up to DK, and for each dose, uh, for each patient, sorry, that is treated at a given dose, the outcome is bivariate. We have toxicity, yes or no, and efficacy or response, yes or no. And for the time being, let us assume that both outcomes are observable within the same time interval. Although in practice, both toxicities and responses may be observed with delay. In the figure, the dose toxicity probability curve is in red. And as we can see, it's monotonically increasing with dose. The dose response curve is in green, and it's also monotonically increasing with dose. And the probability of efficacy without toxicity, which is the product of the conditional probability of efficacy given no toxicity times probability of no toxicity, is in blue. And as we can see, this curve is non-monotone, and there is a dose that maximizes probability of efficacy without toxicity, and it's referred to as the optimal dose. Of course, this dose is not known up front, and the experimental goals may be estimating this dose as precisely as possible and to cluster those assignments at and around that dose. This slide shows several classes of phase one, two designs that can be considered in practice. The non-parametric designs make no specific parametric assumption on the dose toxicity efficacy relationship. The dose escalation rules for these designs are very simple. They're frequently based just on the data from the current cohort of patients treated at the given dose. A good example is the up and down design by Ivanova. The second class is Bayesian utility-based designs, and these designs use parsimonious models with Bayesian priors for the dose toxicity efficacy curve. The dose assignments are performed adaptively to target doses with desirable efficacy and toxicity rates. And some examples are bivariate continual reassessment method by Brown and FTOX method by Tolan Cook. The third class is the adaptive penalized optimal designs. So similar to Bayesian utility-based designs, the adaptive penalized optimal designs are model-based, so they use parsimonious models for the dose toxicity efficacy curve, but they perform those assignments adaptively to minimize some criterion that provides a trade-off between statistical efficiency and ethics. So the more statistically rigorous and they have more well-defined objectives for estimating the target dose with due precision. And this was developed by Dragolin and Fedorov in 2006. So here's a description of uh, an up and down design, some brief overview of the design rules. So a three category outcome model is assumed. We have uh, the possibility of no efficacy, no toxicity, efficacy without toxicity or toxicity. And for the JS patient, suppose the dose at which the patient is treated is DM and the outcome is ZJ. Then the next patient's dose is determined according to the outcome of the current patients. Uh, so it, this dose may be one of the three possibilities, either the current dose or the two adjacent doses. So if the outcome is no efficacy and no toxicity, then the next patient is treated at the next higher dose. If it's efficacy without toxicity, then the next patient is treated at the current dose. And if toxicity is observed, then a dose de-escalation is made and the next patient is treated at the lower dose. Appropriate modifications are made at the lowest and highest doses. So this design is actually very simple to implement. It's rule-based and it has 
established theoretical properties, in particular, it induces a Markov chain on the lattice of doses. So it has high probability of correct identification of optimal dose, but it may be not ideal under some uh, uh, some experimental settings of the dose toxicity efficacy relationship. The bivariate continual reassessment method. So this design is an extension of the CRM method and it's proposed by Brown um, in 2002. So the design assumes the working model for marginal efficacy and toxicity probability. So these are one parameter logistic models and um, a correlation between these two uh, relationships. So the pre-specified desirable efficacy and toxicity rates are used to determine the doses of uh, to be targeted. The dose assignment algorithm is as follows. Given the data from J patients, the model is updated for both toxicity and efficacy and the dose for the next cohort is chosen to minimize the distance to the dose with the targeted efficacy and toxicity rates. There are early stopping rules for excess toxicity and or lack of efficacy. So some of the design highlights, it has a high chance of correctly identifying the target dose with those response that are steep around that dose. And it has a high chance to stop the trial early when no target dose exists. It also has statistical software that's available for use. The FTOX method. So this uh, method was developed by Thol and Cook in 2004, and it's um, a little more complex. So it uses a six parameter bivariate model for efficacy toxicity outcomes with independent normal priors for the components of the vector of unknown parameters. There's an investigator elicited in efficacy toxicity contour to quantify desirability of doses and to direct dose assignments. And the dose assignment algorithm includes the step to determine a set of doses that are acceptable, that satisfy the requirements for toxicity and efficacy probabilities. If the set is empty, a decision is made to stop the trial. Otherwise, the dose is selected from the set of acceptable doses that has the maximum desirability. So the design has a very good operating characteristics, probability of correct dose selection and early stopping, and it has high proportion of optimum dose assignments. The software is available from the MD Anderson website. The adaptive penalized optimal designs proposed by Dragolin and Fedorov in 2006. These designs are also model based and um, the experiment starts with uh, specification of some parametric probability model for the efficacy and toxicity. But the key uh, object of this design is the Fisher information matrix for the vector of unknown parameter as a measure of estimation precision of the design. So the trial is designed adaptively to minimize at each step some statistical criterion while penalizing the doses that are too toxic and or inefficacious. In fact, this adaptive penalized optimal designs, um, this pr design provides substantial improvement in terms of accuracy of estimation of the dose efficacy toxicity relationship and the target dose. And the design has established asymptotic properties, consistency and asymptotic normality of the estimators. Given various available phase one, two designs, one may ask a question, which one to use in practice? And in fact, it's difficult to recommend any particular design as best. So the design performance depends on the trial goals and the underlying dose efficacy toxicity relationship. The trade-off between design simplicity and efficiency is important. 
up and down design, for example, is very simple to implement, but it may not be optimal from the statistical estimation standpoint. The bivariate CRM and F talks are more sophisticated and require more calibration, but they may provide extra advantages due to the learning about the dose response relationship. Um, and adaptive penalized optimal designs result in improved accuracy of estimation, but at the expense of complexity. And so these designs may be challenged from the standpoint of IRBs and therefore very careful considerations are required to justify the use of the design. Overall, uh, phase one, two designs outperform the conventional three plus three method and some other more simplistic designs because they have higher chance of selecting a dose that is both safe and efficacious or biologically optimal dose. The simulations under standard to worst case scenarios should be routinely used to calibrate the design before it is implemented in practice. And this slide provides some useful references, the books that uh, are written on specific phase one, two clinical trial designs and model assisted designs, and also a handbook for designing those finding trials. There's a chapter that I uh, wrote on those finding designs with efficacy and safety endpoints. And please work with the statistician when selecting uh, a design for the chosen trial. Finally, let us highlight some additional important topics on clinical trial designs for rare diseases. When relevant historical data are available, for example, on natural disease history or from the placebo arm on clinical trials, such data can be very useful for eliciting prior distributions and facilitating Bayesian modeling. Clinical trial designs can tremendously benefit from borrowing of historical data, especially when there is a high uncertainty on model parameters. Adaptive designs for single arm trials and for randomized controlled multi-arm trials with Bayesian borrowing from historical data are increasingly used in rare disease settings, both in early development and confirmatory trials. And this topic merits a separate discussion. N of one trials is another potentially useful design for rare diseases and small populations. And the idea is to apply a crossover design principle to the study of a single participant. And the added value of this approach is that the participant acts as his or her own control, minimizing confounding and reducing variance. Identifying proper use cases and situations when N of one trial designs can be applied with most net benefit is an important research topic. Master protocols such as basket, umbrella, and platform trials are increasingly used in drug development, in particular in rare disease settings. Such trial designs can increase the efficiency of drug development, both in terms of trial operational aspects and statistical considerations. Some less commonly used methods, such as ranking and selection designs and response adaptive randomization, may be very useful in situations when disease outcomes are grave and the disease is rare or very rare. In this instance, a large proportion of patients who have the disease will receive treatment as part of their participation in the trial. So clearly there are many more important topics that merit separate presentation, and hopefully some of these topics will be covered in this lecture series. Thank you for your attention.